So good evening. Uh, uh, welcome to tonight to the 583 participants that we've got here tonight for tonight's webinar on a patient-centred approach to achieving better outcomes for people living with schizophrenia and the viewers who are watching on the podcast. So the Mental Health Practitioner Network would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders past, present and future for the memories, traditions, the cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. So hi, I'm Julianne White and I'm facilitating tonight's session. So just a little bit about myself, I just want to, I won't take very long, so I'll just scroll down my screen. Um, I'm an accredited mental health social worker having graduated in 2003 with a Masters in Social Work and this is after 30 years as a registered nurse in a variety of health settings. And I founded the Amaranth Foundation in 2009 and with my amazing team of counsellors, support workers, nurses, mental health nurses and mental health social workers, we provide a range of support and therapeutic services across southern New South Wales and North East Victoria. And I'm thrilled to be your facilitator this evening. It's a discussion that is very much needed and very dear to my heart. So understanding the lived experience of people with schizophrenia and hearing from a range of speakers here tonight as well as having an opportunity to participate in this interactive question and answer session will hopefully reinforce your already existing skills or provide you with information and resources to be able to venture tentatively and gently into this space and that is working alongside people with schizophrenia. So tonight I want to introduce you to our panellists. So here we've got, um, we've got Russell. So Russell is a lived experience and an advocate for schizophrenia. Now, what I'm going to do is ask each one of these people an introductory question before I go on to the next one. So Russell, in your bio, you mentioned that you are always on a constant pathway to recovery. Can you please tell us and everyone here tonight, what is one of your recovery highlights? Um, <clears throat> early days, volunteer work was important in terms of the value of not only a voluntary hospitalisation but a, and the admission, but also the value intrinsic in giving to others rather than being a taker. So for mm -hmm. me, about I believe in a philosophy of being good to others, um, mm -hmm. and that's helpful in terms of the values and the skills that I've learnt through the voluntary work that I've done. And I carry that through and, and onwards and upwards in trying always to do those little things that people remember or helping a lady across the road or helping a mother with her shopping when she's got a handful mm. of kids and shopping and all that sort of thing. So just the little things that, that you can do um, right. to me makes mm. a, making, it's about making a difference and my, I guess, m motivation is about making a difference as well. Yeah. So little things that I can do that I can contribute to is sort of... That is really beautiful, that. Russell. Thank you for that. That's really lovely and I think that's really important for us to remember as clinicians that it's often the little things that really do matter. Now over to Dr. Cathy, Dr. Cathy Andronis from Victoria. She's a general practitioner. So welcome, Cathy. Now your Hi, introductory Hi. Your introductory question is for your patients living with schizophrenia, what are some of the benefits of having a stable relationship with their general practitioner? Well, having a stable relationship with a GP um, is usually the best way to get um, the best outcome, really. Um, so good engagement with the usual GP on a regular basis um, is really important for um, getting best outcomes, um, getting to understand that person, knowing their supports, understanding their families, um, and most importantly, um, to be holistic and to treat mm. the patient, not the disease. So um, a good relationship with a GP can hopefully achieve that. Um, I've got a follow-up question for you in the Q&A about that, but thank you so much, Cathy, that's lovely. And now we go to Melissa. Dr Melissa Connell is a, a psychologist from Queensland. Welcome, Melissa. Now, Melissa, I've got an introductory question for you. <clears throat> and I note in your bio, which is really lovely to read, excuse me, that you work with the Australian Psychological Society's Psychosis and Psychology Interest Group and the Australian branch of the International Society for Psychological and Social Approaches to psychosis or the ISPS. Could you please explain, I've never heard of these amazing groups, could you please say what do you do in these groups, Melissa? Sounds really interesting. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, we know that um, 
people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia often struggle with uh, the way this is seen through a, a biomedical framework and medication is often the mainstay and sometimes the only form of treatment and unfortunately medications also have a lot of significant side effects and adverse health outcomes so psychological approaches can really play an important role in treatment and they're not often um, recommended uh, to people who may struggle with psychosis related difficulties mm -hmm. so the organizations that I'm involved in are, are really trying to promote psychological approaches to understanding and supporting people with psychosis related problems Oh, wonderful. Look, thank you, Melissa. I think that's great. And I'm sure you're going to explain more about all of that in your presentation too, aren't you? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And now we go to Dr. Richard Lakeman, who's a mental health nurse from Queensland. Welcome, Richard. And Richard, your introductory question is, what is it that you find rewarding about working with people with schizophrenia? Um, I'm um, privileged to have um, trained as a nurse and a psychotherapist and one of, I guess, the unique um, um, experiences that, that we have is spending prolonged periods of time over long periods with people in extreme states. So that affords the opportunity to really understand or, or attempt to understand their experience. And I, I find that enormously rewarding, the different perspectives, um, the understanding that, that, that can arise in, in that kind of relationship over a period of time. And um, I guess also um, in relation to what Melissa was, was talking about in terms of psychological strategies, um, uh, being able to uh, adapt and apply those strategies in the context of that kind of uh, different kind of relationship, not quite psychotherapy, um, you know, not, not a 50 minute hour, but you know, uh, walking alongside people um, and then seeing the rewards from that, the, the, the personal and functional recovery that, that uh, that generally uh, ensues. Oh, Richard, that's a, that's a really person-centred approach, isn't it? I really love that when um, you really appreciate that experience with people and the positive outcomes. So thank you for that. Um, so thank you to all our panellists tonight. That was really excellent. I really know we're going to have a fabulous evening. So I hope my nerves don't get in, in the way for tonight, being my first um, webinar. But to, um, to all the participants out there, we've now got 740 uh, participating with us. But just to introduce the webinar platform. So there's a chat box, which is your purple button. So if you want to um, have a chat, I presume that's about with yourselves. And if you have a question, please use the blue hand button and enter your question into the blue hand button. And please put your questions. I'll be monitoring the questions throughout the presentation today. The slides and resources are available from the light blue download button. And there's a help button if you need assistance so that you can message Redback directly or you can ring them on 1800 733 416. Hang on a minute, I just jumped a slide. So it's the third slide. So what we're going to do tonight is we've got everybody giving, uh, all the panellists giving a discipline-specific presentation, which we're then be following by question and answers. We've already got up on the screen there for you the learning outcomes for tonight, so I'm not going to go through them tonight because I think what we've got to talk about, uh, we want as much time as possible to talk about our case study. <clears throat> so if everybody's ready, I'll move through on to discussing uh, with our first presenter tonight, and that's going to be Russell, who's got a lived experience of schizophrenia and an advocate. But I want you to just um, just go back to it, think about the case study of Cynthia, who we'll be, we'll be talking about tonight and relating our information back to Cynthia and her personal or particular situation. So Russell, over to you. Thanks, Julianne. Thank you, everyone. Um, just some tokenistic things that have helped me along my journey um, that maybe in the context of Cynthia uh, be useful for someone like her. But bear in mind that it's just a, I'm just one off, one off thousands or million, millions. So this is really the key things that have worked for me that I'm trying to, I guess, realise. So believing in um, myself or believing in something, be it the medication, which which is was an imperative part of my 
medical team, um, doctors and family alike. Um, it was important that I found a doctor that did believe in the medication rather than just prescribe it without any real knowledge or understanding of the implications of it and how to, I guess, fine tune it and tweak it if the need arise, arose. <clears throat> um, sometimes, however, um, medication is not the be all and end all because, in my case, sometimes it overcompensates or undercompensates um, with the brain chemistry on the day. So having a, a backup philosophy or some some sort of belief system in that you can attune yourself positively to, I found helped. And medication was is a good recognised system and um, and a staple, I guess, in, in terms of my recovery. So I really benefit from that belief in the medication, both from my doctors and my family. Um, I'm not one to um, condone or condemn the church, but more so, it's, I'll put it up there because it's a belief, a belief in something. And when you've got nothing else but hope, then I think I think a belief in something is more tangible um, to, to uh, subscribe to. So moving on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> I talk about accepting the illness. Um, and accepting that you have a condition and uh, although it's hard to get your head around that it's lifelong, you think as a consumer or as a, as a participant myself, uh, with the experience, it's easy to think you're having a good day and you don't need the medication or, or that things are okay, they're going to be okay. But life cycles often throw you a curveball, throw everybody a curveball. Um, so it's important to be able to see I guess see the forest through the trees um, and also know that um, things will get better um, if you do have a bad day or a bad couple of days, but also knowing on the flip side that not every day is a good day and knowing you know, vice versa that things can, can turn. Um, that, those ups and downs with, or the, between the peaks and the troughs is where the insight is gained, I believe. I, I believe that is the, when you're outside of your comfort zone the biggest learning opportunity for any individual. And for me, that is where the mentoring and coaching and the support that I got through those periods of time when I needed help wasn't when I was doing really well. It wasn't when I was at rock bottom and you know, bedridden. It was when I was on the way up or on the way down that, that the support uh, really garnered um, some, me some strength and, and, and optimism in getting through <clears throat> the difficult times, um, and I guess accepting that you have an illness, accepting that it, it's not a weak, well, I've written as, I've prescribed it as a weakness, but it's not actually a weakness because of all the support around you. How lucky are we to have all the life coaches and the, you know, the best people in the business, in the mental health field, and, and, and others, industries, to want to help people like us to be better people, so... If you can get on top of your illness early by doing the right thing, taking the medication and following the treatment plan, um, we can have a reasonable crack at having good quality life. So I believe those things are, are important and as we get older, we want to help the younger people. Um, so the support um, seems important, I think. Um, just moving on to the next slide, um, about the ups and downs, uh, I note that any ship will nearly always self-right if tipped over. Um, the cycles of life, the ebb and flow of the tide, we, heard, we all know these metaphors <coughs> and things. Um, it, it's just help, helpful to know that things will come good again. It's a bit like rolling the dice eventually and numbers, you know, you, you do get a, your numbers, eventually the numbers come up, they come good. It's hard. But like right now, trying to present information that I'm not so confident in, but I know that at the end of the day, this seminar, webinar will really work out for people and you know, believing in what we're doing is, is helpful. So talking about um, favourite foods, there's sometimes um, moments in, it, in the schizophrenic or the person with schizophrenia is life where things aren't great, the chips are down. Um, so having a favourite food or something to focus on as a reward or an incentive, even if you can't have it at the time, certainly um, a bit like the, the the donkey and the carrot. I guess it, it does incentivise um, you to 
to reward um, and it does certainly help to have something of a grounding even if it's in your own mind but that's obviously what naturally where a lot of problems come up they can't always be discussed can't always be you know, um, easily spoken about so having a little self-reward is helpful um, and just one last note, notation about Christmas and family gatherings, which for the schizophrenic or person with schizophrenia, it's very, very hard often. Family gatherings with the, the, the pressure, the stress, um, the fitting in with the rest of the world and the family who know you, who knew you, um, it can be very confronting and very difficult for other reasons as well. So just finding it, keeping in mind a place where you want to, where the person wants to sit <coughs> has always been helpful for me. Um, just so you can get fit in, but you can also have a get out if you need to. It doesn't matter who you're necessarily you're sitting with, but it helps ground uh, the experience of gatherings or other any other social um, activity where where it's a little bit uncomfortable, a bit like the the, the reward for cheese. Um, it's um, a bit of a grounding technique that I've used and has really helped me along the way. Um, rewards are positive, they're not always constant, but life's problems and answers aren't always constant. So just having something to um, take the edge off, I find, um, through that grounding experience is really helpful. And I think it's that's me and I think it's back to you, Julie. Julie Well, Russell, look, thank you so much for everything you've said there. And as a clinician, your words have been really powerful and I really thank you for your honesty. And I think there's an awful lot that we can use that we'll bring up in question and answer. So thank you so much, Russell. That was really excellent. You're welcome. And you throw over to Cathy now. And Cathy's going to talk about the diagnosis and etiology of schizophrenia. So over to you, Cathy. Hi, everyone. Look, um, the, the first slide that I've got is just the DSM-5 diagnosis of schizophrenia. And it's really is there really as a revision. Um, to make a diagnosis of schizophrenia, you need to have at least one month of um, symptoms um, so, um, from a group um, including delusions, hallucinations, disorganised speech, dis um, disorganised behaviour or catatonic behaviour and what we call negative symptoms which are reduced emotional expression or lack of volition, um, reduced self-care perhaps and impairment in one of the major areas of functioning for a significant period of time after, um, since the onset of the disturbance. And so often we'll see people who have had disturbance in their work, interpersonal relationships or in their own self-care. Overall, you have to have reduced functioning for at least six months. Um, and it's important to differentiate that this person doesn't have schizoaffective disorder or bipolar or depressive disorder with psychotic features. Um, However, diagnosis is very difficult uh, and often these diagnoses change over time and it can be a lot more tricky than just applying a DSM-5 um, diagnosis. And just briefly, the etiology that we're looking at, there's so many causes of schizophrenia, it's not really understood that well as a disease. It's thought that genetics and environment both interplay um, and the precipitating and um, predisposing factors will be very different for every individual. So it's very important to treat the individual, as I mentioned earlier, not the disease. People with the um, genetic risk, we usually find family history is one of the greatest predictors of risk. And uh, if you have a, a first degree relative with, um, sorry, with schizophrenia, you will have about a six um, fold relative risk of developing the condition yourself. And this increases to a uh, times 14 uh, relative risk if you have two or more first degree relatives and 50% if your identical twin has schizophrenia. But as we know, that means that in most cases, probably um, having an identical twin, um, you're equally likely not to develop schizophrenia. And so environmental factors are hugely important. Past traumatic experiences are thought to be important perhaps some exposure in utero to infections or in early childhood may be also important in the development, but also things such as drug and alcohol, very important. Brain chemistry changes have been noted, but we really don't really understand those 100%, nowhere near 100%, we know there's a relationship between schizophrenia risk and autism and um, OCD, for instance. 
Um, but substance abuse is a very important differential diagnosis. Um, Drug-induced psychosis in younger people can be very difficult to, uh, to separate from schizophrenia, and it may be a prodrome of schizophrenia, or it may be just something related to drug use. Um, <coughs> but we certainly know that drug use can promote and precipitate schizophrenic episodes. So moving on to my next slide, um, the com common symptoms and challenges, well, as I mentioned, diagnosis is often uncertain and, it, and it's quite common for patients to receive multiple diagnoses, so often a provisional diagnosis and the diagnosis can change over time. I've had plenty of patients who have been given diagnoses of schizophrenia and, and schizoaffective disorder and um, personality disorder and drug-induced psychosis and in the end, that's where it becomes very important to treat the person with what they need to be treated with at any particular time. There's no biological marker for schizophrenia. <coughs> if you say, compare with um, heart disease, where we can do tests and say, yes, this person has this disease. In schizophrenia, it's usually a historical um, assessment. And so it really helps to know the, the patient or the, the client, the person. And over time, you may find that you need to modify your diagnosis or your impressions. So diagnostic uncertainty is very distressing for both for patients and, for, and is very stigmatising. And I think that mm -hmm. that's what Russell was saying earlier and the importance he noted of accepting your diagnosis. Um, but I think that takes time. And I think a, a GP often is mm -hmm. faced with the challenge of having to give a diagnosis that people don't want to hear, um, which is totally and completely understandable. So supporting a person through that just takes time. And we know that people with schizophrenia, especially in their early stages, um, have a lot of denial of their disease because they don't particularly see that there is anything wrong with them. GPs are often put into yeah. a double bind, <coughs> um, which is often what um, was thought to be one of the etiologies etiological factors for schizophrenia in the past because we must label patients in order to be able to prescribe medications and to start treatments, to do plans. So PBS and Medicare require that we have a diagnosis, um, but we have to sort of be able to remain sensitive to patients' needs and concerns about that stigma and about the medication. So in fact, the diagnosis is really for us as providers um, and for administrators and so this is an important thing I find to explain to patients, that, that I'm not labelling them as a person, I'm labelling the, their illness at this moment and because we need to label it in order to be able to manage it and treat it with the best things that we've got available in our society and our community. Um, Cynthia's a very typical patient, but there's no... Um, um, t um, absolute, you know, or ideal or um, um, stereotype patient, really. Everybody um, expresses their illness very differently, and GPs are um, experts at individualised patient care. And so, and understanding the person is the best way you'll get a good trusting relationship between a doctor and the patient. And having a regular GP. Um, gives you best outcomes. So there are studies that sh um, clearly show that the patients who have regular reliable GPs um, and that they see on a regular basis have the best outcomes in schizophrenia and in most diseases and illnesses generally actually. So for GPs, schizophrenia provides multiple um, challenges but also opportunities to help people with um, access ev evidence-based approaches that will help them to be most uh, um, effective. Melissa mentioned earlier that she thinks it's important for us to promote psychological approaches and therapies in schizophrenia, and I totally agree. Um, older GPs were very much uh, perhaps um, taught a biological model of disease, but we know that for at least the last 15 to 20 years, GPs have been trained um, you know, as they come through medical school and beyond <coughs> in a biopsychosocial approach. And, but as a GP, we have to manage, ma uh, manage the biological parts, which is the effects on the body, because um, there are high rate of comorbidities. We have to mm. man uh, yes. manage the treatments and um, medications. Socially, we need to manage isolation and social drift and poverty. So there are lots of um, challenges related to um, being um, financially 
um, disadvantaged and and obviously so psychologically um, there are lots of effects of schizophrenia in mood, thinking, relating skills, anxiety. So good engagement with the GP is um, on a regular basis is really important for avoiding um, the negative symptoms such as poor motivation, the withdrawal, isolation, also managing anxiety, the ambivalence, um, helping people accept themselves, managing the stigma, um, providing act active follow-up and engaging the whole patient you know, is a whole of, of practice approach really. So it's just not, it's not just the GP, it's also the nurse, the practice nurse, other GPs in the practice and also a, um, a multidisciplinary team to make sure that that person gets the best available care that, that is available for them locally. And GPs are often the case managers, usually the case managers, and sometimes the only person that, that the um, p patient will trust. And if that's the case, well, we try to do um, all if we have to, but we do it best if we have support and we have lots of people um, involved in the patient's care. Um, we as GPs recognise patients' triggers a lot of the time, so we get to know them and we can start to see early warning signs. We know, often know their context and their families, so this can be really helpful. And our aim is to go along, as Russell was saying earlier, to support them on their journey. So a familiar GP um, would be really helpful. So in the case of Cynthia, the loss of her regular GP would have been something that would have placed her at more risk in the last few years. And so, and I, as Melissa was talking earlier, I certainly concur with her and people with schizophrenia absolutely definitely benefit from regular contact and counselling with SPS um, providers. And they're able to um, engage with all types of F SPS modalities with a trusted therapy. But it's really important about picking the right therapist and the right treatment and in the right dose for any particular person at the right time. And it's important that we um, avoid making judgments about people and make allowances though at the same time for their negative symptoms because there'll be times that they don't really feel like doing particularly much or engaging. So we have to be flexible so, and engage slowly and patiently. So thank you, Julianne. Oh, wonderful, Cathy. That was a really great summary, so thank you. I think we'll have a few questions based on that in the Q&A. <clears throat> so now we've got Dr. Melissa Connell. So, Melissa, over to you. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, as I was saying before, there can be uh, a lot of value to bringing psychological approaches uh, to supporting a person with psychosis. So. People do want to make sense of their experience and helping them to develop self-understanding and build more effective coping strategies can have the benefits of reducing, I guess, the reliance on medications. While medications can be very important, being able to get by on lower doses can lead to improvements in quality of life and well-being. Um, and as people develop better self-understanding and, and are able to, to manage um, difficulties that arise, hopefully that can also lead to uh, a minimisation of the need for hospital admissions. And of course, psychological approaches are always working within a recovery framework. So um, referral pathways to see a psychologist uh, many people come through better access, but unfortunately there's just 10 sessions a year, so uh, that often means um, you know, meeting less frequently. Uh, some people that have been lucky enough to get an NDIS package might be able to see a psychologist more often, but uh, there's also private health options and both government and NGO mental health services. So for Cynthia, I think it's really important to get a good developmental history. Uh, I might do a timeline with Cynthia and look at some of the things that have happened in her life and how it's affected her because we know she's had some significant adverse experiences that may be predisposing factors <coughs> in her uh, developing psychosis later in life. 
I'd be using a stress vulnerability model and that could be very helpful as well with understanding uh, the psychotic experiences that have emerged more recently for her. Um, there are a variety of assessment tools that can be helpful. The SIRAPS, uh, the Maastricht interview, uh, which looks at voices, and the BPRS. So I'd be wanting to work together with Cynthia to develop a collaborative formulation where we can look at, at making sense of what's going on together. I'd be um, wanting to build a really strong relationship with her so that she can build trust with me. Sometimes people with psychosis have had negative experiences with prior mental health treatment, uh, especially hospitalizations can be quite traumatic. So building trust and having a strong therapeutic alliance is really important. And I want to respect how Cynthia makes sense of her experience. And I want to be careful that I'm not imposing my interpretations onto uh, her understandings. So I'd like us to both, uh, well, to come up with a working hypothesis together. So I think um, to begin with, we'd really want to look at reducing her anxiety and distress. And we know that these are big precipitants of psychotic experiences. I'd be looking at building more uh, adaptive coping skills for her to manage. Um, also, there's a, a potential that there's unprocessed grief associated with the loss of her father that may also be uh, precipitating uh, her difficulties improving mood, increasing her activities, and again, that recovery orientation. And I just want to point out that these are all very similar areas of difficulty that you'll find with other clients, you know, presenting uh, for therapy to psychologists. And often psychologists think that treating somebody with psychosis might be beyond their scope or that they don't have the experience or the expertise <coughs> necessary to do that. But you'll find that people with psychosis have the same problems as everyone else. They struggle with loneliness, with depression, with feeling isolated and different from other people. So there's a lot that psychologists can do to support them. For those people that might want to do more focused work with voices and delusions, there are, are psychological approaches that have been found to be quite effective. ACT for psychosis, relating therapy for voices, uh, compassion focused therapy for psychosis, and CBT for psychosis. And when working with voices, the aim is to really look at the appraisal and interpretation of the voices and understanding the beliefs that Cynthia has about her voices because often that's where the distress lies and the distress is what fuels the struggle with voices. So you really want to be focusing on how she might change the relationship with voices because sometimes it's difficult to get rid of voices, so how can you learn to live with them? And in relation to delusions, I'd be very careful because these are experiences that Cynthia accepts as they're, they're real to her. So I, I don't want to be invalidating or pathologizing of those experiences, but I want to focus more on just reducing the distress associated with them, helping her to feel safer and building up her engagement with other areas of her life. And it would only be over time, if she was showing curiosity, that we'd explore alternative explanations, and that might be more within a CBT framework. But that's something to do very tentatively. So over the longer term, um, we'd be looking at uh, you know, things that are, are going to help Cynthia improve her sense of self, how she might feel connected to others, finding meaning in her life, a sense of hope, opportunities for self-determination, and always consolidating those more adaptive resources for coping. 
and definitely linking her in with community supports. We'd want to understand her personal stress vulnerability factors because that's very important in relapse prevention. Um, ongoing support for managing anxiety and, and voices would be important. She may like to participate in a hearing voices group. And it's worth uh, exploring if there is any unresolved trauma associated with things like uh, the bullying she experienced. And there are trauma-focused treatments such as the MDR that also have been found to be effective. So I'm hopeful that I would have a long-term relationship with Cynthia and uh, we could continue to work together in, uh, in years to come. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was really great, Melissa. And I think we're going to have a lot of um, good comments and fantastic questions coming through about all these presentations. So looking forward to that. That was excellent. So now we're moving over to Richard. So Richard, over to you um, with your presentation now. So my, my experience has largely been um, in, in terms of having a long-term relationship um, with people either in uh, long-term psychotherapy, in a set of community treatment teams where um, the, uh, the time period is kind of open-ended where we might work with somebody. So I would enter this relationship um, uh, you know, with, a, with a sense that we're in this for the long haul, that we don't need to panic. And the, the, the really the first thing is to, to get to know each other and build some kind of shared understanding. Um, and in particular, attempting to understand the world as Cynthia experience it, experiences it with um, curiosity, with humility, with respect, with openness, um, uh, basic em empathic uh, listening, particularly for the untold story. Um, as Melissa alluded to, often people come with a, a history of trauma. Um, you know, often we come with our own assumptions about uh, you know, how things have arisen. Um, and we're, we should always be open to be corrected. Um, some people might see this as, a, as a, an assessment phase. I, I see assessment as a sort of a, a process rather than a, a, an outcome. Uh, it may involve um, uh, you know, doing some explicit kind of uh, exploration around voices. Uh, it might involve something like um, open dialogue, which in itself is a, a, uh, an intervention and in that uh, you know, people within the network get together uh, um, with, a, with uh, an openness to, to develop some shared understanding through dialogue. Um, whenever you get to know somebody, and this probably applies to, to uh, people with a range of problems, I always find it useful to um, ensure that people go away from the get-go with some, uh, something which is helpful to them. Um, and it's always useful to normalise some of the extraordinary experiences um, that people that experience psychosis uh, might have. Hearing voices are not that uh, uncommon. Uh, jumping to conclusions, uh, having certainty about um, uh, things went, that we later find out, you know, that uh, weren't founded, um, are really common experiences. So normalising that, sharing that can be really helpful. Um, and um, exploring positive mental health, um, positive um, and using a framework such as um, PERMA, um, you know, trying to find things that give positive emotion that, that engage um, Cynthia, um, promoting kind of meaningful relationships, um, doing things that give a sense of accomplishment, um, purpose, physical activity, nutrition, sleep and so on. Um, you know, I think the most significant and salient thing in, this, in Cynthia's um, story was that she's grieving. Uh, she's lost a really significant uh, uh, person in her life. Um, and, you know, that grief needs to be worked through and experienced as well. Um, and it's okay. It's not a sign of pathology. So don't panic. Um, and it's really useful to try and mobilise and extend any kind of supportive network. So Melissa alluded to the Hearing Voices Network, which is, uh, you know, really helpful, um, uh, you know, really helpful in overcoming a sense that, uh, that uh, people sometimes have that they're alone in these kind of experiences that no other people experience just like them. And then we move on to a kind of working phase where Cynthia 
begins to actually identify with the nurse or other as a, as a helping person. And here we might um, begin to explore a, a, a detailed developmental and trauma history, not as a, as a moment in time, but building up this kind of, um, uh, you know, this historical understanding of where Cynthia's come from. And um, here we really strengthen, strengthen and mobilise what resources that we have. Um, it's, um, uh, the coaching role is probably, you know, uh, quite key. It's a good way, useful way to think about this. And we might coach with dealing with paranoia and intrusive thoughts. Uh, and, I, and this is where uh, we can get some insights from um, cognitive behavioural therapy and other ways of working with psychosis. So things like um, the insight that having a thought does not make it a fact. Um, and so changing this, you know, the, 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 the thought being a fact to I, I thought that, but I really know this um, can be helpful. And it's useful to, to have coaching around that to, to, to play with that idea. Uh, and similarly, having a strong feeling doesn't mean something you know, bad will happen. So I feel, but I really know that. And still in the, the working phase, assisting with coping with voices, um, uh, th this is a handout that I developed around some research around coping with voices. Um, about 20 years ago, and it's still relevant. Um, so um, this, this will be available as uh, um, a, a link. Um, and so this um, um, assists people in, in dealing with some of those beliefs about voices that can be problematic. That is that um, voices are all-knowing and all-powerful. So um, exerting some control over the voice-hearing experience, um, dealing with the intrusiveness of the experience, which can often cause distress. Um, here we might look at rationalising medication and, and really clarifying the expected effects of medication. Um, so, you know, medication will not necessarily alleviate, you know, uh, all symptoms. In fact, it's very rare that that is the case. Um, so, you know, what, what is the role of medication and how can it be helpful? Um, and here we begin to arrive at some kind of working formulation uh, and we might b begin to do some real goal setting about moving forward. Um, in the exploitation working ending phase, Cynthia really begins to exploit the helping relationship um, that she has with the, the health professional to clarify um, what needs need to be fulfilled and, and have these needs met in the context of, of that relationship. And therapy at this time might become more formalised and negotiated um, as suggested by the formulation. So uh, if, um, if you know, there are you know, residual traumatic experiences, then we may do some trauma-informed trauma work. Um, EMDR, as um, uh, um, Melissa uh, suggested, you know, as, as one possibility. Um, I like to um, consider the idea of advanced empathy as being a form of therapy in its own right. And that's really about um, not only just appraising you know, and, and communicating um, with accuracy how another person is, feels, but actually making a connection between, between how they feel and what's going on for them uh, psychologically or what's going on for them in, that, in, in their world. Um, that's been written about by Jerry Egan recently, and again, there will be a link to some uh, work that I've written around this notion of advanced empathy. Um, here we might also begin to really look at recovery planning. Uh, we may well be uh, well into that, um, but the idea of relapse prevention, so you know, a wellness recovery action plan, who's going to do what you know, and, uh, and when, uh, and any referrals if needed. Uh, Richard, thank you so much. And you brought up some fantastic points there, especially at the end about how to actually link all this up together, because a big part of tonight's um, webinar is that whole collaboration and how can we get the best outcome for people. Look, we've got some fantastic questions here that have been um, sent through. So I'm going to, I've got a couple though that I've thought of as well. So but Russell, I wanted to just touch base with you a little bit if I may. Mm -hmm. You were talking a lot in metaphors. We had a bit of a chat before tonight about the role of metaphors and clinicians' work of using things like that and using your phrases. Like you talked about the waves and um, you can be very, you were mentioning too that some people with schizophrenia or other comorbidities can be very literal. Do you want to expand on that a little bit for me? Um, yeah, just for mine, speaking on on the on the participants' terms, 
um, is really helpful. Um, so metaphors, if someone uses a strong, has a strong case of metaphors in their repertoire for talking, I think it's useful to engage with that. Um, however, people with, with Asperger's are very literal. Mm. So if you said, go, let's go down the frog and, let's hit the frog and toad, they'd probably go get a hammer and look for a frog <laughs> and or a toad. But there are, in my case, I was brought up, my dad's a, um, old school and a bit of a knockabout sort of, in, in some ways, um, and found some family members are. So we have a bit of fun um, with metaphor. So it works for me and I understand it. Um, but I think for whatever makes sense, some, sometimes there's no easy way to sugarcoat things mm. um, other than metaphors. Um, yeah, so, no, that's yeah, a really good yeah. point. Yeah. Thank you so much, Russell. I think it's really important. So, And I like your differentiation between, between people with other conditions that might also sit alongside schizophrenia like autism or Asperger's that might be very literal. But it's very much that relates back to being very person-centred, isn't it? Understand the person. Now, Kathy, I've got a couple of questions here. There's quite a few, actually, from um, Ryan, particularly up about uh, factors to promote or hinder engagement with GPs. Um, and how can we influence that relationship to be better? Do you want to comment about that a bit? Uh, yeah, um, thanks, um, Julianne. I think the main issue is to not rush the relationship, to build trust slowly. Um, understandably, patients with schizophrenia have, have, are quite um, weary of um, professionals. Um, they've often had um, awful experiences in inpatient settings. So that I think we first of all have to understand that they're going to be perhaps anxious. Um, mm. In fact, likely to be anxious when they come to see a new GP. Um, and so we should be underst understanding of that, trying to make that person as comfortable as possible and to get to know them as a person. I think the most important thing we can do is to forget about the schizophrenia for a while, you know, and think, who is this person here? And, and um, what, what do they like doing? What's their everyday life like? Um, mm. Who do they live with? How do they manage their everyday life? I think once we get to know them as a person, we then find that they open up and give us a lot more um, information about the things that are distressing them. And therefore, we've got more opportunities to be able to support them. Mm. Yeah, that's a really that's good point. Yeah, yeah so thanks, Kathy. <laughs> we keep interrupting each other. Sorry about that. Um, there's a couple of questions here also about working with adolescents. Um, so perhaps, um, Kathy, I know, Melissa, perhaps you would like to address working with younger people. Uh, is you, do you take a different approach or is there a slightly different presentation for adolescents? Um, yeah. Just, what do you, what's your feeling about that? Uh, yeah, uh, working with younger people can be a, a really powerful time. So there are specialist services for early intervention for psychosis. Uh, you've probably heard of Origin and Melbourne and Pat mm. McGorry. They've been real trailblazers in this area. So um, we can, if we can intervene early and provide a lot of support and a lot of resources, there's the view, and there is some research uh, that's showing it, it can help to avert that trajectory of a more persistent psychotic disorder. So working with adolescents, um, is, it, there's, it, it's definitely a, a big focus mm. uh, of treatment. And it is a bit different. You, you need to work a bit differently with adolescents and, um, and, and really, um, uh, I guess, you know, try to understand what's going on for them. But it's quite traumatic when somebody has their first experience of psychosis as well. But trying to help them understand it, trying to avoid some of the, the stigma that comes with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. So they often, we often uh, hold off giving diagnoses. Uh, such as schizophrenia, because they can mm. be quite self-fulfilling. People can feel, you know, that their, their life is over when they hear that. Gee, there's some really good points, and there's so much media, isn't there, and some of the um, 
um, television episodes that portray schizophrenia in a fairly negative light can have a real detrimental effect, can't they? Mm. And I think just while I've got you there too, though, Melissa, if you could, and then I might go to Richard, but there's um, a couple of questions, one from Keith and Kathy, about the management of atypical transient psychosis with unusual features of schizophrenia. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Um, Melissa, just to, you know, how, how do you actually work with that? And I think you just mentioned too that you held back from a formal diagnosis of schizophrenia. So would this be in one of those instances, do you think? Yeah, it, that's a, a, not a diagnosis I'm familiar with, but I, I'm assuming that's hmm. more of a, a, a brief psychotic episode. Yeah. And when we, we uh, you know, we, we know that psychotic experiences are more common than we think. And there are people in the general population that uh, when they're faced with significant stresses, their risk for experience, experiencing psychosis can elevate. And it may not mean that they are going to develop a schizophrenia type illness, but it, it's, it's an understanding that they have a susceptibility in stresses such as um, you know, not sleeping, taking substances, interpersonal difficulties, you know, whatever is going on for that person, mm. and put them over that threshold. And so uh, these experiences can resolve um, quite well, and people can go on to manage that vulnerability, but never have another uh, psychotic episode in the future. That, that's just my understanding of, of mm. what was, yeah, that question was asking. I, I don't know what yeah. you think, Richard or Kathy. Yeah, so Richard, would you like to comment on that? Um, I, I prefer not to around the, the diagnostic issues. I think we can get lost in, in you know, the diagnosis. Um, you know, but in terms of um, you know, what we can all agree on is that you know there's some psych psychotic symptoms can be very transient. Um, some you know psychotic type experiences can be can be very transient and, and under stress or when you know intoxicated and so on. Um, uh, and but you know the the, the experience um, uh, of uh, you know that that cluster of, of of experiences you know that involve you know perceptual disturbance, thought disorder. Uh, delusions and so on can can have a um, a, a much more pressing kind of quality, uh, and uh, people in the ch in the chat rooms have been uh, you know talking about people with a great deal of complexity that are pushing people away that uh, you know whose behaviour is driven by paranoid thoughts and ideas, and um, you know we can meet the person wherever they wherever they are you know I, I think um, and uh, it's our obligation to to do so um, and to extend to them. Um, some some helpful strategies to to, to deal with the experience. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Richard. I think that's a really good answer, and I think that being present with the person is absolutely critical. Those um, the rapport mm. building, isn't it? And that sense of knowing the person is so critical. So, Kathy, could I ask you, sort of, just, just staying on that atypical transient psychosis, so perhaps a, a third person's first experience of psychosis, is that something that you would see? in a GP clinic that might, um, you know, you might be sort of looking to collaborate more with some of the people around you. Could you comment a bit more on that too? Yeah, early psychosis is really, really challenging. Um, yeah. You know, it's very much about getting a history from the family quite often rather than the person. Um, the person themselves is often very reluctant to seek treatment. Uh, and so that's where it can be helpful to have already mm. had a relationship with that um, person or with their family. Um, and again, we need, we need to aim to treat the person and so treat their symptoms, treat their functional incapacity, um, support them really because I think mm. that and, and avoid making diagnoses, especially for younger people because a lot of these things Perhaps a lot of transient things are a drug-induced psychosis. Perhaps it's just um, an extreme form of anxiety. It, um, it could be a situational thing. So I think that we should try as much as possible not to get too caught up on the actual diagnosis as well. Uh, it's not particularly helpful um, 
for everybody all the time. So mostly we just want to um, think about what can we do to make this person feel and function better mm. in their everyday life. Mm. Actually, that leads me on to, there's a fantastic question here from Tom that was put up previously. And it needs, I'll just read it out as it goes. It says, is it time to put the term schizophrenia into a historical context? How far have we come with the terminology? And do we, is this something we need to get rid of? So what's your feeling on that, Cathy? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's very much mm -hmm. going to be something that's important for, um, to continue with from the um, very theoretical academic perspective because we know that medication does help people a lot. It helps a lot of people a lot of the time, but many mm -hmm. people with schizophrenia just use minimal amounts, so we are sort of stuck with diagnoses, unfortunately. But I think we need to take those with a grain of salt. The DSM is now a much, much bigger manual than the mm. first DSM, so we should bear that in mind when we look at any diagnosis. And if anything, as people have already alluded to, have mentioned this evening, um, psychotic experience is a part of a continuum. Anybody under stress can experience a psychotic illness. Um, people with a fever develop delusion, uh, hallucinations um, just temporarily. So we have to be mindful of not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You know, we accept yeah. that diagnoses are useful, but we also accept that we just have to manage people for who they are. Can I also so, add something? Just the community... Uh, yeah, Russell, that would be fabulous. Mm. Just community education similar to what um, Kathy's um, um, informed with or seemingly, uh, so it seems that she understands pretty well from my perspective, from a consumer's perspective, is that we're just normal people, just to have an illness, it's no different to diabetes or asthma, it's just a, a manageable illness. Yeah, it can be pretty ugly to start with, but you know, um, I don't want to say anything too negative, but you know, lots of things are ugly, scabs are ugly, but you know, big deal, you get on with it and then life gets better. Uh, recovery is possible and, and is evident in a, a lot of people these days, more so than back in the 70s or the 60s or even early 80s. So recovery is possible, life is an opportunity and with the right support and the right um, group mindset from our commu the community at large, we can as consumers live a pretty good life or a reasonably good life without the stigma, without the traumatic sort of um, experience that you get at work or from workmates or people that just don't understand. So education is really <clears throat> education and for what from the from for the self and for the for others is really important to break down those barriers, I think. Oh, Russell, gosh, you've put some great insights. I think we're all, yeah, it's so, so true, isn't it? That it's just learning how to live the best possible life you can, isn't it? Yeah. But while I've got you there, Russell, can I ask you, um, I mentioned this earlier to you, but and there's a few questions I'm noticing on the questions here about diet. Um, so there's one here particularly. Um, is, is poor di does poor diet have an effect on, on yourself and your experience? So I mean, what's your experience of the relationship between mood, behaviour and food? So well, would you like to comment a bit on that? I can, I, I can only try. Cathy's probably yes. better versed than I am, but I'm happy to give it a okay. crack. I love yes. a meat pie or five as much as any other bloke in this country. Yes. But in saying that, I know what it does and the effect on the brain chemistry and the body, this body's biological um, organic matter, uh, whatever mm. it is, the bloodstream, the carbohydrates, all those things can have an effect, just like medication can have an effect. Um, just like eating too much makes you too tired. There are obvious non-schizophrenic type decisions or problems associated with the wrong food or, or correct food. So some foods are really good, um, and we all we don't nobody it doesn't take an Einstein to know what you know fruit, veg, water, grains, meats, dairies, and all that is. Mine's cheese, mind you, but um, it's, it's just um, matter a matter of looking after oneself as if um, as if you were the last, you know, like as if I don't know. So Kathy, I think you're probably. I reckon you're better versed in diet 
dietary sort of things. Uh, that's well, a really good could... segue, Russell. Thank you. <laughs> Um, if I if I just had a brief well a uh, brief comment then about um, diet, it's, there's no doubt that psychotropic medication affects metabolism and people mm. do put on weight um, and they do find it difficult to lose weight. However, um, I think that is only one of the determinants, and the other um, m more important determinant that I see is actually uh, social issues related, um, often because of. Um, um, Poverty, financial distress, people can't afford to eat um, fresh fruit and vegetables. Or they may be isolated. Or they may, because of their negative symptoms, not feel like getting out of bed and, and cooking themselves um, a, a, a um, healthy meal or buying fruit and vegetables. So that's where I think um, psychological support um, and social support in a multidisciplinary sort of team allows people to learn how to cook. I have patients who have found cooking lessons extremely helpful and useful. Um, dietitians um, can be really helpful when they understand a person's context in how they can best um, support themselves and therefore develop the healthiest diet that they can. Actually, great. Thank you for that, Kathy. That's really good. And I agree with you. Sometimes it is finances that actually hinder adherence to a, a good diet. It's, it's just pretty expensive. A lot of people are on uh, very low income, so that's definitely. But I think it's still, from a multidisciplinary perspective, really important to include a range of clinicians, i.e., you know, dietitians and um, whoever else is, you know, we can actually utilise to have that person realise the um, difference that they can make. Uh, quite a few questions here about um, medication adherence. Um, so one from. Um, uh, Mari that says, could you cover strategies for medication adherence and coping strategies? So, um, Kathy, just having you back again, can you talk a little bit about medication adherence for us? Well, medication ad adherence has always been one of the biggest challenges in people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia because understandably the one, people don't necessarily believe that they have the condition or want to believe the condition. Um, and may not have um, developed acceptance that um, Russell was talking about earlier um, yet for their condition. Um, I think that's really critical. Once people can be gently supported to accept that they have that condition, and that may involve lots of counselling and lots of support, then they um, often can see the pattern that they do feel better and function better when they are on a particular dose of medication or are having particular support in their life. Um, so I think that yeah, that, that's a very important part of um, of, of it to, to, to get adherence. But we also know that um, that different medications are, um, have different effects on different people. So I think it's a conversation that uh, patients should be having with their doctor and or psychiatrist or the treatment team. Could I change to a different medication? Can my dose be lowered? Um, what else can I do? I think there are options. I think often. Um, Patients with schizophrenia aren't particularly assertive, so any sort of mm. counselling that increases their assertiveness will help them to be able to talk about those things and so to increase their adherence and therefore um, decrease their side effects by minimising the doses so we're not treating more than we need to treat, just enough for, or just good enough really for that person. Yeah, yeah fantastic, Kathy. That's great. And, and really important then to have that collaboration between providers too, which I think is important. May so, I comment uh, on, on, on that um, issue? Yeah, just briefly, because I've got one more really important question that I want to ask Richard for. So go ahead, uh, Russell. Sh um, I think um, it, it's really scrupulously important that we um, treat people with honesty, that we, we hold them in high regard, um, and, and we need to be really honest about the effects of medication uh, with people. Australia has the... Um, the dubious honour of having the most involuntary treatment of any country in the world. A recent um, study in Lancet Psychiatry of 22 countries, and we are double the median number and the highest in the world. Compelling people, coercing them, does not make them want to take medication. Uh, so we need to, to build good relationships with people. We need to be honest about the effects, and we need to inquire about the effects. So we need to say, what is this medication targeting? What can you expect? You know, what is the, you know, the, the minimum amount? 
if uh, this is going to cause metabolic problems, people need to know. They need to know about you know, that the, that the potential risks associated with, with medication and, and, uh, and you know, really collaborate with, with the prescribers and those that uh, care about them. Can, can I also Thank add? Who's that? A Russell this time, the other Russell. Yep. <laughs> Sorry about that mistake before. Yep. The good looking one. <laughs> um, You've just got one minute, Russell. Yeah, I only need 35 yep. seconds. Okay. Um, the medication adherence is difficult, but if you have some success and hit some, hit some runs early on, you're going to have more likely, more likely to have prolonged success with the medication regime. Yeah. So if you can make a big difference early on, which involves good psycholo psychological treatment and support, and the medication is sort of secondary, but also just as important, I think you'll get better strike rate from my experience. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. But look, I want to whiz back to uh, Richard, if I can. Richard, we've got uh, quite a few questions around hearing voices. Um, and you mentioned that in your work there. So I've got some from Anita and quite a few other people here. Um, just about our coping strategies for hearing voices. And then I've got something around, you know, how do you normalise hearing voices? Do you actually engage with people's voices? You have got one minute to talk about the impact of uh, clinician engagement with voices. So can you do that? Uh, I think there are, there are a, a, a few kind of issues or, or kind of techniques or approaches. One I mentioned was open dialogue, which is a, a, a treatment approach that was developed in, uh, in Finland, in, in, in Western Lapland, um, in response to what was called their, their, their needs adapted approach to um, schizophrenia and psychosis. Uh, so that's um, where um, um, professionals and sometimes peers engage with the network in a humble way to try and build some sort of understanding about the problem. So we don't go in there with our diagnostic lens, you know, equipped with our bag of pills. We, we, we go in there when people are acutely unwell and we try and collectively make sense of this experience. I don't have time to go into that. And, no. and then the other is the, is the um, uh, voice dialogue which is where one actually um, construes the voice as having something useful to say, um, that you know, the, voice is, the voice content is meaningful and says something meaningful about the person's uh, uh, experience. And then somebody um, dialogues with that voice. So the individual themselves can actually go into dialogue with the voice, which are um, dissociated, considered dissociated parts of the self. And so one can actually learn by um, engaging in a dialogue with the voice. Like say, what do you want? You know, you know, uh, you know what, what will it take for you to leave me alone if, it, if they're intrusive and so on. Uh, so again, that's mm -hmm. another kind of technique and, and uh, you know, people are wanting to explore that. You know, there are training opportunities and, and, and things around that. I would say join ISPS, um, the, the organization Melissa uh, alluded to or referred to, uh, they have a, 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 um, a book list, um, you know, so they produce publications. There are many of them on these different approaches um, as psychological and social approaches to psychosis. So I'm gathering a lot of those will be up on the um, resources page, won't they, Richard? So um, but look, what we have to do now, because we're going to run out of time very quickly, but I want to go back to everybody and just recap quickly if you've got a pressing point or something you just would like to say, you've got about a minute each. So Cathy, can we go back to you? Um, is there something you would like to just finish up with tonight as, as a parting message for everybody to remember? Um, I think the parting message I'd like to leave is that we uh, sh should see people um, for who they are and develop relationships with them and be patient centred. I support everything that everybody else on this panel said and, and um, I'd like to leave everybody with the thought of our job is to really to offer people hope and to hold their hands and yeah. support them. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Cathy. And I just think they're beautiful words. Absolutely. Um, Russell, what would you like to let everybody take away with them tonight? Um, just that family and, and connectedness, family connectedness, social and medical support is really imperative and it does make a big difference. It might not seem so on certain days to the professionals, but you take that home with you and you think about what was said in an appointment or you know, a week later you think what somebody said and it can make, have a lasting impact. So the recovery is possible. It takes often some time for the penny to drop. 
um, mm -hmm. with certain advices and certain um, aspects, but um, the information is all, all together gathering and really important. Mm. That's a really important point, you know, that recovery is possible. Thank you so much, Russell. I think that's brilliant. Melissa, have you got a, a lovely parting comment for people to take that they'll remember from tonight? Yeah, um, I think we, we really want to respect people's right to determine their own experience. Mm. And, and we come in uh, telling people they're delusional or what they're ex we're imposing our interpretations onto their experience. And in ISPS, we have a lot of people who are considered experts by experience, and they play an important role in educating uh, mental health professionals about um, what it really is valuable, and I think we really need to do more listening and less telling. Really good point, Melissa. Thank you so much for making that. It's so important. Now, Richard, um, just a, a one minute. Have you got something that you would like people to take away? I, I agree with everything everybody said. I say, you know, I think people um, listen to people, but also talk to them. Uh, I did some. Um, um, research about you know 25 years ago around how people coped with voices and the most surprising thing was people said nobody's actually talked to me about this stuff before they never, and that people were really um, enthusiastic about sharing their experiences uh, so you know talk listen you know try and be humble and try and you know develop a shared understanding with people um, yeah, I think recovery in, in, in every in, in every kind of recovery whether it's personal recovery functional recovery is in, entirely possible and, mm. and really where we should be aiming. Um, Do you have, um, and I want to go back to Kathy too, we've got a couple of minutes, so we're a little bit ahead by oh, not one minute. Um, just about collaboration, Do we? How, have any of you got something passionate to say about improving collaboration between um, all the players, the people, the, the, the people living with schizophrenia, their families, the clinicians, the doctors? Is there anything any of you would like to add or comment about collaboration specifically. Uh, yeah, um, thanks Julianne. I'd like to make the comment that the best way to call um, for us all to, co um, to coordinate care and cooperate is to pick up the phone and talk to each other. Um, mm. That's the best way that we can um, discuss um, and help people uh, and not to just sit as invisible people in, in invisible offices. Pick up and talk and involve the person as well that was schizophrenia. Can I um, add? That's a fantastic point, Kathy. Thank you for making that. It's so good. I've yes. got a point, Julianne. Russell yeah, go on, again. Russell. The good-looking one. The good-looking one again. <laughs> um, His birthday is tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. And my twin brothers. Um, just one point for me is that mental illness doesn't happen nine to five, Monday to Friday. Ah. Uh, uh, as unfortunate as it is for those that work office hours. Um, for us, it's often a Friday night or a Monday morning or a Saturday night or Christmas parties or whatever um, that's really difficult. So having uh, preparation or mindfulness as to what those certain things look like and having the mindset of a, not the worst case scenario, but, but for the clinician to, to understand what the person might, go, what, is, what they're about to go through on a Friday night or a Saturday, because we go through more on a Friday night than most people go through in a month. <laughs> when we're really unwell, yeah. and it's really taxing. So just um, yeah, just um, bearing in mind that um, it's not a an office job. It is a full time job, but it's not an office job. So mm -hmm. yeah. really good point, Russell. Look, thank you so much for making that point. And I think that's something we can all take away from tonight: is that it's not a nine to five experience. So that we as clinicians and carers in the community must be very mindful of this from that person's experience. Um, look, our time's up and I just want to thank absolutely everybody for contributing. I've learnt so much to light. I think there's been a lot of information. You know, just flip the side over. Um, and I just thank all of the participants, all the presenters tonight for giving of their time and their information. It's just been great. And I hope all the participants have learnt a lot as well. Um, I do want you to complete the exit survey. You can see that up on your screen by clicking the yellow icon. Please do that before you leave tonight. And the next webinar will be Suicide Prevention and Safety Planning for the Veterans Community. Um, this is going to be in partnership with uh, Veterans Affairs on the 14th of November. And I think this is going to be a wonderful um, presentation. So 
if we could all consider joining in, that'd be great. Um, and just a really important point to make here is that the Mental Health Practitioner Network supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines uh, meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share topics and resources, build local pathways and engage in CPD activities. So if you'd like to join your local practitioner network, please contact the Mental Health Practitioner Network um, here or go to the new section of the website and indicate your interest in the exit surveys. And please yeah, consider joining a, um, a network. I personally find them extremely valuable. And before I close, though, I'd really like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with a mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. And on behalf of everybody here, I'd really like to thank you and thank everybody for participating this evening. So thank you very much.